Hello everyone, welcome back to my YouTube channel. I hope you're doing well. In this video, I'm gonna talk about writing personal narratives. Let's get started. I adapted the materials from my perspectives, American literature, and um, I hope it helps. Let's talk about personal narrative. What is personal narrative? In personal narrative, the author tells a story about himself using a first person point of view. First, you should begin by choosing an incident from your life that has shaped your view of the topic. So you will have a topic to talk about and then you choose some experience, you choose an experience or incident from your personal life. Then you develop that memory into a narrative, sequencing events so that they reveal how you acquired the view you now hold. So gradually you talk about events, first it happened, then that one, and you just connect it with the perspective that you have right now. And then you connect your ideas to details from the text you have read. If you have any text in your book, you can just connect it with something from your text to make it stronger. Now we have some elements of a personal nar narrative. Here, a personal narrative is a first person story about a real life experience. And in a personal narrative, the author is the narrator. So when you write it, you are the narrator. So you should write, I did it, it happened to me, and so on. Here, it should have a clear and consistent point of view from the beginning till the end of your narrative, your writing. There should be a smooth sequence of events or experiences. First it happened, then that one, after that, blah, blah, and so on. And then effective use of dialogue and or description to develop the events and characterize the people in the narrative. You should, um, you should also have some dialogue to make it real and probably the description that you have to develop the events and uh, characterize the people. You should also talk about the people in your narrative. And then using precise words and sensory language to clarify experiences. When you use sensory language, language that uh, show me, uh, give me the same experience that you had, I can also understand your experiences. And then a conclusion that follows from and reflects on the events presented in the narrative. You should also, you should also have the conclusion in your narrative. And finally, you should proofread it to check the grammar and spelling. You should have error-free grammar and spelling. Now, let's talk about pre-writing and planning. Imagine that you have it for your school, so you have time to pre-write, to plan, and to establish the situation. First, you should reread the questions that you have in the prompt. Yeah, generally, you have a question from your teacher or from the task. And then you have to think about the text you have read and your own experiences, because generally they are relevant to a topic that you have in your school or probably in your exam. You should think about it and also your personal experiences. Then think about a situation that influenced your views on the topic. For example, let's say you have a topic about individualism. So think about a situation that influenced, affected your understanding on that topic in a positive way or a negative way. And then you have to break down the situation into consecutive events and then tell how you felt then and how you feel now. So you talk about first that happened and after that, blah, blah, and uh, now how you, how you feel now. Here, when you plan uh, your writing, you can also follow this, uh, uh, follow this slide. First, for example, blah, blah happened, how I felt then, how I feel now about it, and after that, next, then, and finally. So have this draft for yourself to make it easier for you to write your narrative and connect the past with present. And then gather evidence. 
Your evidence for a personal narrative often springs from your own memories. So you are important here. It can be something simple, a memory that you have, or something complicated. It is just from you. And then draft, developing, developing conflict also can help you. All narratives are, are driven by conflict, a struggle between opposing forces. So there is a struggle over there in your experience, and it starts from that conflict that you have. And the conflict may be internal or occurring within the thoughts and feelings of a narrator or person in this story. So the conflict might be also in, inside, in, it might be internal. So you have it, nobody can see it, but you can see it. So it is your thoughts or probably your feeling. So we can talk about the conflict that you have in your feelings or in your opinion. Or alternatively, the struggle maybe is external or occurring between two people or between a person and an outside force. So pay attention when you think about the experiences that happened to you or one experience, pay attention also to the conflict, um, either internal or external. Inside them, you, I mean, uh, in your thoughts or feelings or external between you and another person or external force, the situation. It makes it easier for you to write uh, your personal narrative. And a story is more engaging for readers when the conflict is clearly developed using precise, exciting language. So when you have that conflict in your writing, in your narrative, it makes it exciting for the reader, for your teacher to follow it. And uh, using precise, accurate language and also exciting language would make it even better for the reader. Now, let's uh, talk about also following the story structure. All narratives follow a basic progression in which the conflict is introduced, developed, and resolved. So you should introduce the conflict, then you have to develop it, and then something should be resolved. The conflict should be resolved, should be solved. And as you write, Decide which details of your narrative belong in each section of the plot. Here in the exposition, set the scene and introduce the conflict. So you should provide some details to the reader. And after that, in the rising action, climax and falling action, present events in chronological order, build the conflict to its point of greatest tension, and then resolve it. And after that, in the conclusion, reflect on the events described in the narrative. So first, just describe it, describe the conflict, and then uh, develop the conflict to just uh, take it to the climax, to the maximum level, and then you will have falling action. And after that, to just uh, go to the conclusion, which will be, uh, which you just uh, resolve, resolve the tension. Here, for example, in the book that I was teaching from Up From Slavery, and we had exposition, narrator arrives at Hampton, looking shabby after his travels, head teacher fails to see him as an individual worthy of Hampton, her school. And then it is the exposition that we have over there. And after that, we have main part of narrative. We have rising action, for example, the person, head teacher, orders narrator to sweep. He cleans the room thoroughly in the story that we have. Then we have the climax. Teacher evaluates the room that he cleaned. And then we have falling action over there. Teacher accepts the narrator. And then as a conclusion, adult narrator reflects on the incident and explains its importance. So in the reading passage that we had, just we had these orders. Now, you should also organize your personal narrative. Here we have an organizer. You can pause this uh, part of the video or you can take this screenshot. And so when you write your narrative, you should have your exposition. Then think about main part of, the na of, a na of narrative, rising action, climax, falling action in your uh, narrative, and then conclusion. 
it will definitely help you to organize your narrative perfectly. And then adding variety, precise words and phrases would make your writing much better. Here, as you know, the English language contains more than 1 million words. Nevertheless, as you read, you may find that only one word best fits your meaning for a certain detail. So always try to find the accurate words to describe your feeling or what you mean. And that's why if you have time, always use dictionaries, thesaurus to just make your vocabulary much better. And narrowing down language to choose precise words and phrases means finding the word or words that say exactly what you mean, which is important. And then read it. Over here, for example, we have some examples from the text that we had in our book. To me, it had been a long, eventful journey. But the first sight of the large three-story brick school building seemed to have rewarded me for all that I had undergone in order to reach the place. As you see here, we have undergone. Undergone means experience, but it has a connotation of suffering. It suggests that the author had a journey that was long and difficult. So instead of that, you could have, uh, we could, I mean, the author could have written experience, but undergone just explained exactly what the author felt. Or in this example, and these are examples of a personal narrative. As you see, we have also I, to me, I felt, and so on. I felt that I could hardly blame her if she got the idea that I was a worthless loafer or tramp. As you see here, the precise nouns loafer and tramp combined with the adjective worthless reveal that the author, the text that we had, Washington's fears, it reveals Washington's fears about how the head teacher sees her, sees him. All right, let me move. And then let's write it. As you draft your personal narrative, carefully choose words that exactly express your feelings, actions, and observations. Here are a few examples that show the power of precise language. As you see here, we have simple sentences, simple language on the left, and more precise one on the right. For example, the meal was good. I wore a red top. Well, I'm sorry, we all felt sad. They walked up the road. Be careful, I said. Now here we have simple language. How about the right part? Can you just spend a few seconds to read them and pay attention to the differences? As you see, we have more precise language over there. Just pause for a few seconds, read them carefully, and compare more precise language with the simple language that we have on the left. And in your writing, try to use more precise language. Try to use more precise language. Okay, now reflecting on events. The difference between a compelling personal narrative and a simple anecdote is that in a personal narrative, the narrator usually reflects on and comments on events from the past. So pay attention to it, it's different from, an, from a simple anecdote. Nonfiction narrative writers relate events in sequence, in order, but they also describe their feelings about those events and explain why and how those events were painful, instru instructive, or inspiring. So when you write your narrative, you should also pay attention to these points, explain how you felt, you know, the events were painful, instructive, inspiring, or what. Now connecting the past to the present, as we said, it is also another feature of personal narratives. Writers of a strong personal narratives reflect on the importance of the stories they tell by connecting the past to the present, 
So there should be a connection because you want the reader to think about what you're writing. In any personal narrative, a reader must understand the importance of the memory being recalled. Why are you just sharing it you know, with me? So I should understand that the importance of it. And for example, in the passage that we had in our book, Booker T. Washington connects his present self to his past self. He points out that although he has passed many exams in his life, the sweeping test was the most important because it allowed him to start his education at Hampton. This led in turn to his life as a teacher, an author, and an orator. If Washington had omitted the sentence that connects the past to the present, the reader might not understand why he recounted this incident in his autobiography. So he connects the past with present. He says, without that exam that I had, I wouldn't be able to be a teacher or an author right now. So he connects, he explains the importance of that event. And uh, use the following steps to integrate your feelings into your narrative. Here, have you mentioned your then feeling from the chart, if you have a chart in your essay? If not, decide how you might work it into the narrative. Here we have some basic examples. For example, event happened, making me feel what? I was never more happy than when event happened. So try to just complete these phrases in your narrative to make it stronger. Remember that you may also show how you felt through dialogue or by describing actions or appearance. Here are some more sophisticated examples. I can't believe my luck. I moaned as blah, blah, blah. So you can also include some dialogue in your narrative. And for example, as event blah, blah, event happened, my face got hot and my hands felt sweaty. Consider how to include your now feeling. This might appear near the event in question, or it might appear in your conclusion. Here also we have some examples. For example, I felt blah, blah, when that event happened, although now it just seems funny. So you connect past with present to just make it, to just emphasize on the event that happened to you. For example, here, although the events were traumatic at the time, looking back, I realized that they taught me a valuable lesson. So again, you connect past with present. And use precise words. Here, readers will better understand your feelings and ideas if you use powerful, precise words. Replace some of your feelings words with stronger, more precise choices. Use a dictionary to help you. And revising for evidence and elaboration would be the next step. Use sensory language, return to your narrative and imagine that you are a stranger encountering your story for the first time. Imagine that's the first time. So decide whether any sections feel flat or uninteresting. Just make it interesting for the reader. Then consider adding sensory details to show what you as the narrator saw, heard, smelled, tasted, and felt. This might involve simple additions or changes to certain words. Just probably by simple addition, you can just make it more meaningful and more interesting to your reader. And consider these examples that we have here. For example, the first one, the lacking sensory details, I walked slowly along the path. Now we have using sensory details, the second one. Just compare them 
And here we have another example. Again, one of them just lacks sensory details. Another one uses sensory details. Read them for a few seconds and compare them. All right, that's it. I hope it helps. And don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel, like the video and share it with your friends. Hope to see you again in my YouTube channel.